The scripture today is found in Numbers chapter 18, verses 2 to 7. So bring you also your brothers of the tribe of Levi, your ancestral tribe, in order that they may be joined with you and serve you, while you and your sons with you are in front of the tent of the covenant. They shall perform duties for you for the whole tent. But you must not approach either the utensils of the sanctuary or the altar. Otherwise, both you and them will die. They are attached to you in order to perform the duties of the tent of meeting for all the service of the tent. No outsider shall approach you. You yourselves shall perform the duties of the sanctuary and the altar so that wrath may never again come to the Israelites. It is I who take your brother Levites from among the Israelites. Uh, they are now yours as a gift, dedicated to the Lord, to perform the service of the tent of meeting. But you and your sons with you shall diligently perform your priestly duties. In all that concerns the altar and the area behind the curtain, I give your priestly, I give your priesthood as a gift. Any outsider who approaches shall be put to death. This is the word of God for all of God's people. All right, as we're talking about priests, just a show of hands of anybody who grew up Catholic or Episcopal or Anglican or somebody who's had experience in those traditions before. Okay, so you have very strong images when we say the word priest. You have very strong images of what that might mean. I um, did a sermon series here a, a number of years ago on Christianity's family tree, and I went to a Catholic church and I interviewed this priest who get a little bit more of a personal effect of what Catholicism was all about. And I said, you know, priests have this kind of image in the world, and I'd love to know from you what is the uh, biggest misconception that you think people have about priests? And he said, confession. Um, and all of you who grew up Catholic, tell me how wonderful was confession for you? Most people have this perception, he said, of this priest on the other side who is just shocked by what you are telling him and um, just and perhaps judgmental through the curtain of what you are telling him. And he says, that's not what it's like at all. Most of the time confession is like this, <laughs> of just listening to people's everyday needs, listening to people's everyday worries, listening to people's everyday things that they think are a big deal, and they are journeying with them through this. I'll never forget the first class I took at TCU once I had changed my major from biology to religion was a class called the Christian Ministry and it was taught by a five foot five powerhouse of a man named Bobby Wayne Cook who was a retired naval chaplain and the very first thing he said to us was somewhere along the lines of as priests in the service of the Lord Jesus Christ you have the greatest responsibility ever granted, and that is to affirm the forgiveness and love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's what confessional is. It is being that intermediary between God and the people of saying, I affirm the forgiveness that Jesus is offering you, and offering that forgiveness on behalf of God. So the priest serves as an intermediary, but it's always been a very Catholic, very Anglican thing. Um, a classmate responded to Pastor, or uh, Professor Bobby Wayne said, Sir, we're Protestants, not Catholics. And Bobby Wayne, or Professor Cook, as I guess I should call him, but Bobby Wayne sounds better. Bobby Wayne responded and said, Well, I guess that means all of you have to do that instead of a few of you have to do this. As we journey through May together with Confirmation Sunday and Mother's Day and Graduation Sunday on the 21st, it's a month full of celebrations, but it's also a month in which we are commissioning people out into the world. We are uh, inviting Confirmation students to take full ownership of their faith and their church membership. We are celebrating the leadership that is the maternal role and the women in our lives who guide us so well. We are uh, taking, you know, 
offering up liturgy around graduates who are going to go from under their parents' wing to fly on their own for a little while. We're talking about these leaders in the Old Testament. And what I hope is that as we're journeying through what it means to be a priest or a prophet or a king or a judge, that you might find something along, uh, something in these stories that you think, oh my gosh, that is what God is calling me to do. Those are the, the gifts and the skills God has called and offered to me that I can then offer to the world around me. And so priest is this function that largely we have um, rejected a little bit in Protestantism. Um, starting way back with Martin Luther, he went and posted his 95 theses on the door of Wittenberg Cathedral and um, as a response and a reaction against the corruption of the priests of the Catholic Church. Now, what happens in just about every area of society, especially religion, and I've told you this before, is that once something gets so bad on one side of the pendulum, we never correct to like the middle ground of the pendulum where everything makes sense again. We always overcorrect to this massive other side. And so where the priests were the intermediaries between God and the people, and they, they were the only ones who were served as the intermediaries, Luther and Calvin and his, their contemporaries, Wingley, switched all the way to their side, rejected the priesthood, and said, no, you have a direct phone call to God. You can receive forgiveness and straight from God, talk to, directly to God. And this is the uh, legacy that we've inherited, but in doing so, we've, like, I feel like we've forgotten and left out this important biblical character of the priest that shows up first at the end of Exodus. At the end of Exodus chapter 40 is when Aaron is commissioned to be the first priest and becomes the head of the Levites, if you will. The Levites are this separated group of the different tribes of Israel are given different lands and and Levites aren't given any land, but they are given um, ceremonial land to have a priestly outpost in each land. And so, um, usually when people are murmuring, there's something crazy going on behind me. Was it the hawk that dove down? Or was it the roadrunner? Or was it the squirrel? Or whatever it was. So, I want to thank the original architects of this building for that window back there. <laughs> as I was saying. <laughs> so, as I was saying, they, the priestly function started in the end of Exodus. It was Aaron who was the beginning of the Levite tribe. And if you have ever tried, how many of y'all have ever tried to read through the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation? How many of you succeeded? How many of you got to Leviticus and your eyes glazed over? That's, yeah, so Leviticus is this very detailed book. So ex the end of Exodus kind of flows into numbers in this uh, story form. Leviticus is this book sandwiched in the middle, and Leviticus literally comes from the Greek word of, of the Levites. And so Leviticus is this book of laws, kind of for in the wilderness, but specifically for the Levites to follow. And you've got um, just this incredible detail that the Levites are charged with to be the intermediaries between God and the people, and largely to help keep the people holy. So their job is to help keep the people holy, whether it is through uh, facilitating sacrifice or whether it is for um, upkeeping the holiness code in people's personal lives or in their community life, to make sure because the people of Israel in the wilderness wandering were seen in this time as lockstep with God. And so if somebody was unclean or unholy in the community, it reflected poorly on God, and God, therefore, would have been unholy and unclean. And in a society where it was like God's competing and battling with each other over, for supremacy, you didn't want your God to have any kind of uncleanliness about you. And so the Levites played an incredibly important role of maintaining holiness and calling people to holiness and calling people to repentance and facilitating that effort when people were contrite and would come and offer a sacrifice of honoring that sacrifice, facilitating that sacrifice, so that they could know the truth that we still hold today. That God is with us, and that God loves us, and that God always wants to continue to be with us and help us to journey towards the holy way of life. Now, there's a lot of rules in Leviticus, and I'm not going to read this all to you, but this is the first rule in Leviticus, and it is the start of five different sacrifices that all have different categories. There are five different categories of sacrifice. This one's called the burnt offering, and it's for atonement. And so if you were to sin against your neighbor or sin against God, you would have to bring your bull to the temple or to the tabernacle at the time, this tent that they were traveling with, 
and the priest would perform the sacrifice on your behalf because they are holy enough to do that. And if you go through this, there are specific directives on how to perform the sacrifice, which end of the bull should go where, what you should do with the blood afterward. It is incredibly specific as you go through. And this is only if you bring a bull. If you bring a goat or a sheep, there's an entirely different set of instructions. If you bring a dove or any other kind of bird, there's another set of instructions. If you bring grain or crops, there's a whole different set of instructions. And that's just the first chapter. There are seven chapters that outline all the details for every circumstance, for every sacrifice that the priests have to know meticulously so that they can do it right. And then from chapter 8 through 16 is all about how, um, how a, a priest has to um, uh, condition themselves or how they have to consecrate themselves is the word I'm looking for. Consecrate themselves to be holy enough to enter into the tabernacle, especially on the Day of Atonement when they're, for, you know, offering atonement for all of the people's sins through this scapegoat, which is where the word comes from. And you look at just the meticulousness of this all, and I would imagine that, like me perhaps, you might either say, one, that's impossible. There is no way I'm ever going to be able to do and remember all of that. Or on the bright side, you might get to the point and you say, you know what? I'm really thankful that God has given us people who can remember and do all of that. I think we have forgotten. We have forgotten that God has gifted certain people with a detail-oriented nature to religion. There is a great movement in the world of, I am spiritual but not religious, perhaps. Or there's a great number of people I talk to. I just did um, wedding Pre, I, I did counseling for a couple who's going to get married in a, in a while, and um, we were talking about faith backgrounds, and they said, I very much have a connection to the Creator. I just don't think I need to go to church to express it. And I said, that's absolutely, you can do that. But in doing so, we tend to create a God who looks very much like us, and who votes for people who look like us, and who act like people who look like us, and who have the same behaviors that look like us. We very much create our own God versus the people who are detail-oriented enough that look at what God is wanting for this world and are able to lead us to a more righteous and a more holy way of life than we would just do by ourselves. This is the gift of detail-oriented people in what we call religion is that they are here to help us see those details of holiness that we are unable to see. They are here to call us into holiness for things that we are not able to recognize because we are not as detail-oriented as them. They're here to follow the commandments of God. They're here to learn the commandments of God. And they're here to guide us in the intermediary or the relationship that we have with God so that we don't make God into our own image, but we are born into God's own image and created from God's own image. Now, the priest that we carry on, I think, is worth carrying on in Protestantism and the way that we practice religion in our way of thinking isn't necessarily the priest behind the confessional wall that is the stereotype of a priest. It actually comes from a different place in the New Testament, from the letter of 1 Peter. And Jim, if you can flip to that. Here we go. So, it's a different kind of priest. First Peter tells us, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Peter is speaking to a Christian community that is trying to figure out who they are in the midst of a world that isn't a Christian community and that doesn't have the same priorities and it doesn't have the same values and that may even look upon this Christian community as a threat to their way of life or their values. But Peter introduces them to the idea that no, it's not just one Levite or one priest who has this role and function of introducing people to the details of holiness or the bigger notion that God is with them and God forgives them and God loves them. But in fact, each one of us is part of a royal and chosen priesthood. This is what Martin Luther would actually come around to call the priesthood of all believers. It is that everybody who takes on the name of Jesus, everyone who takes on the name of Christian, is an intermediary between God and the people that they meet. Our, our former bishop used to have a benediction that is, is a historical benediction of, may the stranger you meet find within you a generous friend. This understanding that wherever we are, whoever we are, whenever we are, that we are introducing people to God simply by our presence being there. Because we are supposed to have this detailed level of holiness 
And when we look at what holiness means in the New Testament, it is this kindness and this compassion and this generosity and this sacrificial love that Jesus offers to us. In fact, the letter to the Hebrew, uh, letter to Hebrews um, talks about Jesus as the great high priest. And it's because of the work of Jesus on the cross that tore the ter- curtain down and it gave us this immediate relationship, this immediate access to God through Christ that even while we were yet sinners, we could do God's work that we are given this priesthood. And what I want you to consider, I suppose, is, is this something that you are gifted with? We're going to talk about different gifts. We're going to talk about spiritual gifts later on. We're talking about different giftedness and leadership roles. And many people think, especially, well, most people think, I'm not a leader. And one of the things that... um, our church has decided that we will need to be about is developing leaders for our community. And the word leader um, really scares people because it means that all of a sudden all eyes are on you. Or it means that you have to make hard decisions. But let me just ask for another show of hands. How many of you have at least one person in your life that you have any influence over whatsoever? You should be raising your hands right now. Because you drove here today And in driving here today, you passed other people, and you have influence over those other people that you drove by. If you went shopping yesterday, if you had to mourn yesterday, if you had to comfort somebody yesterday, if you have kids, if you have parents, if you have brothers, if you have sisters, if you have aunts, if you have uncles, if you have cousins, you have influence over somebody else. You are in relationship with somebody else. And because we have this high priest who opened up the doors for our relationship with God to be this personal relationship, it means that we have been grafted into the priesthood of all believers, which means that whoever you do have influence over, you are introducing them to the love of God. God and Jesus Christ at all times. Now, the detail isn't for everybody, but the love and grace is. That is something that we don't ever get to put on the side and say, I'm not a leader in, those, in that capacity. Because in taking on the mantle of Christ, you have taken on the vows of priesthood in the name of Christ. You have taken on the vows that we're going to ask our confirmation class. These vows that you can see on the screen. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ is open to people of all ages, nations, and races? And according to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? This is what you said yes to if you joined the church. This is the role that you serve in the world if you said yes to the church. But the good news is, is the one that's not listed on there, is that we're not doing this by ourselves. Instead of a holy group of people that are called pastors or a holy group of people that are called priests or Levites, instead of looking at one person or one group as the intermediaries between God and the world, instead of looking at one person as one pastor and saying, that's the person who's going to lead us to holiness, and that's the person who's going to show us Jesus' forgiveness, the last question we ask is not to the confirmation class, but it's to the congregation. And it's, will you accept and nurture those in your care Include them and walk with them. Because we want people who are entering the church to know that this entire mission of Jesus doesn't fall squarely on their shoulders alone. But that we do it together. Because together we are God's priests. Together we are the priests who introduce people to the grace of God, the eternal life of Christ, and the movement of the Spirit that calls us to holiness. So we're all in this. But I just ask you to consider, if you're somebody who's always hated the detailed nature of religion or somebody who's always grafted to it and thought, why don't other people like this as much? I wonder if you're just called to be a priest for us. I wonder if you're just called to be that person that is the voice that says, let me help you find the forgiveness of Jesus. Let me help you stay on the narrow path of grace. Let me help my community to know that there is a different way of life, and it's better than anything we can come up with ourselves. Let's pray. 
Gracious God, it is with humble hearts that we approach your table, the one that you have set before us so long ago that offers freedom, it offers deliverance, it offers unification, it offers forgiveness. And so God, as we come to your table, send us out as your people to be intermediaries between anyone whom we meet and a God who loves them. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.